now uh, our our guest is from Athens, Kara. Hello to everyone. Hi. Hello, Kara. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, Kara uh, Kioni Chotoman, uh, she's from Greece. Uh, she's, she's a PhD candidate at the University of National and Kapodistrian University of Athens. Uh, she, uh, her uh, focus is mainly criminal law and criminal procedure law. Also, she works on the domestic violence and discrimination uh, against women and gender-based violence. Also, she published very good high quality works on this, on this subject, especially at Cambridge journals. And so she is very competent uh, on this issue. Yeah, we are happy to hear you. Also, microphone is yours. Uh, please. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Uh, Gunadin, to everyone in uh, Istanbul. Um, thank you. I would like to thank, first of all, uh, the University of Istanbul and, of course, Professor Adam Sojuer and uh, Dr. Rahim Erbas for this uh, opportunity to talk to you about uh, gender-based violence and positive obligations. Um, the, as you heard from uh, Professor Bonini, who is an exemplary academic in the field of gender-based violence, and uh, I'm really fond of the job and the work that they are doing in, at the University of Pisa on gender-based issues. Uh, this is a really topical um, issue. I will try uh, here because it will be an ex and more um, timely um, lesson to uh, elaborate everything that you heard, to fragmentize everything and try to be sure uh, that after this uh, presentation you'll be capable of uh, having uh, an idea of what positive obligations are, what are the key uh, um, decisions of the Court of the European Rights, and uh, how gender-based issues can be uh, in this context uh, included. I will share my presentation now, just a moment. Great. Uh, so the topic today uh, is positive obligations arising from articles two and three in relation to gender-based violence during the COVID-19 pandemic. First of all, uh, I would like to fragmentize everything and give you a diagram of what are we're going to talk about. First of all, we're going to define what exactly positive obligations are. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about gender-based violence. I want to be sure that everything is clear to you about what gender-based violence is and what are the main offenses when we talk about gender-based violence. Uh, the focus will be on positive obligations under Articles 2 of the European Convention of Human Rights and 3. Article 2 is the right to life and Article 3 uh, refers to the prohibition of torture and inhuman and degrading treatment. Last but not least, um, we're going to talk about how the COVID-19 pandemic affected um, gender-based issues and what are the key challenges in regard to positive obligations. In this respect, I will give you uh, concrete examples uh, from Greece and I will be happy to talk about how things are working in Turkey as well. Uh, so, uh, what are those positive obligations that we are talking about? Firstly, I want to note that uh, positive obligations do not only arise from the European Convention of Human Rights. Positive obligations uh, are arising both from international and EU law. An example of the imposition of positive obligations outside the European Convention of Human Rights is the Convention of the Council of Europe on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence. Is the very known to you, I believe, Istanbul Convention, which is very topical on gender-based issues. Um, this uh, convention applies to all forms of violence against women, including domestic violence, and provides a comprehensive framework to prevent, prosecute, and eliminate violence against women. So positive obligations is not something only affecting the, the European Court of Human Rights. 
Uh, but here we're going to focus on this. First of all, uh, as you may know, the European Convention of Human Rights has been traditionally linked and considered as a way to establish and ameliorate the rights of the suspect and the accused. However, in the latest years, there has been an effort to include victims' rights as well. A way to include victims' rights is the development of positive obligations. I want you to understand uh, that positive obligations um, in the context of Articles 2 and 3 isn't something that it is explicitly written in the Convention. It is something that is made by the case law. According to the Convention itself, only negative obligations arise. What are the negative obligations? It is the duty for the states to abstain, to refrain from violations. For example, in the context of Article 2, it is forbidden that the state unlawfully kills a citizen. This is the negative obligation, to refrain from violations. Now, positive obligations, something made up, as I said, by the European Court of Human Rights, is not only to abstain, but to take positive measures to effectively safeguard those rights. This obligation, this duty, is largely based on Article 1 of the European Convention of Human Rights. If you see in my presentation, this is Article 1, stating that the high contracted, I'm sorry, the high contracted partings shall secure everyone within their jurisdiction the right and freedoms defined in Section 1 of this Convention. This has been interpreted as imposing a general obligation on states. So this is the, the base for developing positive obligations. Before we go on and analyze the case law, I would like to shift the focus on gender-based violence. What is exactly gender-based violence in this context we're talking about? Gender-based violence, or GBV violence, as you may have heard it, is violence that is directed at an individual based on his or her biological sex or gender identity, or, and that's a key, violence that affects persons of a particular gender disproportionately. So, it's not only the motivation of the perpetrator, uh, whether or not the violence is based on the biological sex or gender identity of the victim, but it is the result as well when violence affects persons of a particular gender disproportionately, for example, in domestic abuse cases. It may include physical, sexual, of course, verbal, emotional or psychological abuse, threats, coercion, economic deprivation, and it is irrelevant whether it occurs in public or in private life. So we see then gender-based violence can arise in, in a widespread uh, framework of context. The main offenses, though, when we talk about GBV violence are rape and sexual assault, domestic violence, female genital mutilation, FGM, as you may have heard it, forced marriage, and then these are the key and the main offenses. However, is also cases of physical abuse that can have a GBV character. So physical assaults can be GBV offenses. And of course, femicides. Uh, femicides, uh, I know that to many is a debatable term. It's not uh, something that all academics accept. But here I'm not gonna uh, debate on whether or not a killing of women because of their gender are femicides, but I'm going to use the term in a political way to describe the killing of women uh, in a context when we can see that there is a GBV element. 
Uh, and of course, there are certain cyber crimes, for example, uh, revert event pornography. Uh, this uh, is particularly important in the context of uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic because, um, as I'm going to explain, all the criminality during this uh, lockdown period has shifted from real life to cyber uh, space. So uh, a lot of things that happened in real life, threats, um, coercion, uh, psychological violence towards women, has uh, relocated to the cyber uh, cyberspace. So uh, those are the key offenses that we're gonna talk about. From those offenses, not everything can fall within the ambit of Article 2 and 3 of the Convention. So let's see what the Court of Human Rights consider as an offense that can be included in Articles 2 and 3 and thus give rise to positive obligations. Before we go on there, I would like to uh, make a diagram about what are those positive obligations that I'm talking about, that Professor Bonini talked to you about. In the context of Article 2 and 3, there are three forms of positive obligations. The form, the first form, as you can see, in the presentation is the duty to secure the right by putting in place effective criminal law provisions. This is the substantive aspect of positive obligations. Backed up, of course, by a law enforcement machinery for the prevention, suppression, and sanctioning of breaches. So, set up a legislative framework that actually works. The second obligation is a duty to have in place an effective machinery for investigating complaints and to ensure that a thorough and effective investigation capable of leading to the identification and punishment of those responsible actually takes place. Last but not least, there is also a duty, and this is very important in time of the pandemic, to take preventive operational measures to protect an individual whose right is at risk from the criminal acts of another individual. As we will see, this duty doesn't arise at, in every case, but only in well-defined circumstances. So let's go to the first positive, the first form of positive obligations, which is the duty to set up a legislative framework. In the field of substantive criminal law, the state is obliged to take adequate positive measures in the sphere of criminal law by enacting criminal law provisions. The European Court of Human Rights has established that rape, domestic abuse, and female genital mutilation all fall into the scope of Article 3. So, Combining this first form of positive obligation with this second uh, sentence, we see that member states have to have in place uh, in their criminal code uh, offenses about rape, domestic abuse, and FGM. We must remember that positive obligations imposed on states apply to those offenses both when they are committed by state officials and private individuals. This is something really important. In this context, uh, you should remember the case MS versus Bulgaria and MN versus Bulgaria, because at the beginning of this development of case law, uh, those applied only to state agents, but now the positive obligations apply to everyone. So both state officials and private individuals. All this means, as a result, that any legal framework that fails to provide effective legal protection against abuse falling into the scope of Article 3, so any legal framework that fails to provide effective legal protection for rape, domestic abuse, and FGM, results in a violation of the article in its procedure link. Let's now review uh, some 
corner landmark decisions, in my opinion, of the court on this matter to see how exactly this developed and what, how the European Court of Human Rights treats those offenses. First of all, we have the EU uh, versus uh, Bulgaria. This is a very recent case, according to which uh, it is settled that rape and serious sexual assault amount to treatment falling within the ambit of Article 3 of the Convention. So uh, it is without dispute that those offences uh, are something that the European Court of Human Rights will examine in the framework of Article 3. In uh, Aydin versus Turkey of 1997, we see why the these are the reasons why the Court of Human Rights thinks that uh, this treatment falls within the ambit of Article 3. According to Aydin versus Turkey, rape leaves deep psychological scars. Uh, sorry, I had this chat, maybe a question or something. Uh, oh, sorry, it's Professor Sabini. I'm sorry. So, um, as I said, in Aydin versus Turkey, we see that uh, rape leaves deep psychological scars on the victim, which do not respond to the passage of time as quickly as other forms of physical and mental violence. So, rape, this is why rape is considered a form of inhuman, a degrading treatment. In MS versus Bulgaria, which is a really important case, as I said, we also read that states have positive obligation inherent in Articles 3 and 8 of the Convention to enact criminal law provisions effectively punishing rape and to apply them in practice through effective investigation and prosecution. So we don't only need the framework to exist just on papers, but it has to be effectively implemented. And in Z versus Bulgaria, and also really a recent decision, we read that the contracting state's positive obligation under Article 3 of the Convention must be seen as requiring the penalization and effective prosecution of any non consensual sexual act, including in the absence of physical resistance by the victim. This is a particular important decision because um, as uh, someone that uh, sees the, the, all the relevant decisions of GBV violence and positive obligations, one can uh, see that the European Court of Human Rights is very reluctant in uh, saying that you should have those elements in your crime. It just says that you have to penalize effectively some forms of violence against women and against individuals, but never what actually it must be in the substantive elements of the crime. However, in rape, it says that non-consensual sexual acts must be penalized. This is in line with the Instable Convention which states that non-consensual non sexual acts constitute a form of rape. This is a, a new trend. And actually, I must say that uh, I'm really happy that Greece actually um, included non-consensual sexual acts in the definition of rape recently at our amendment of the penal code. And I would like to also later discuss with you uh, if you think that this is something that uh, Turkey will also consider doing. Um, and just uh, uh, see what's your opinion about that. But uh, as you see, this is something that is um, actually uh, in the Court of Human Rights, and this is something that is going to be discussed in the future. Just a moment. To Okay, uh, so we talked about rape, we saw relevant case law, and now I would like to show you uh, some decisions about FGM, which is female genital mutilation. Uh, luckily, female genital mutilation isn't a topic that arises uh, very often 
in the framework of the European Court of Human Rights, because as a member uh, of Council of Europe, all of us, uh, all of our states, do not tolerate this practice, and it is our common tradition that this practice is not tolerable. So there aren't many cases. Uh, however, as you see, uh, it arises um, uh, predominantly in asylum cases. So we have uh, the Collins and Akazebi versus Sweden, when we read that it is not in dispute that subjecting a woman to female genital mutilation amounts to ill treatment contrary to Article 3 of the Convention, and their RBAB and others versus Netherlands, that sub says that subjecting a child or adult to FGM amounts to treatment prescribed by Article 3 of the Convention. Those both uh, cases were asylum cases. So, we talked about rape, we talked about and, uh, FGM, and now I would like to shift the focus on domestic abuse and domestic violence. Domestic violence, according to the Istanbul Convention, shall include all acts of physical, sexual, psychological, and this is very important, economic violence. In a case of Volodina versus Russia of 2019, we see that the European Convention of Hum uh, the European Court of Human Rights adopts the same um, idea about what are the forms of domestic violence. We read specifically that the issue of domestic violence, which can take various forms, ranging from physical assault to sexual, economic, emotional or verbal abuse, transcends the circumstances of an individual case. This is a very important decision because not only we see that the European Court of Human Rights is in line with the Istanbul Convention, but also give us the why, as we saw about rape, why domestic abuse is a form of inhuman and degrading treatment, because it transcends the circumstances of an individual case. Of, uh, according to the court's case law, it is also irrelevant whether or not the abuse occurred within the family or domestic unit. And the last thing is really important. It can occur between former or current spouses and partners, whether or not the perpetrator shares or has shared the same residence with a victim. A lot of states had in their criminal offenses as a precondition that the perpetrator should share or has shared the same residence with the victim. Greece as well has this precondition. But after the Istanbul Convention, and according and in line with the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, this is something that we eliminated, and I'm aware that other member states also eliminated this precondition, and I would like to hear if uh, actually something that is happening in Turkey right now too. Uh, so, the contracting parties have, according to what we said, a positive obligation to establish and apply effectively a system punishing all forms of domestic violence and to provide sufficient safeguards for victims. What does that mean? It means effective, proportionate, and dissuasive, dissuasive sanctions. It means having available protective measures for the victims. And of course, sanction possible uh, cases of people who refuse to abide by court's decision. This is the framework that uh, makes sure that every national legal order is in line with its positive obligation. Uh, before we continue, I would like you to think and uh, review uh, your national legal order uh, and think if you think that uh, your national legal order actually fulfills those obligations. Uh, is it possible that you write in the comment section uh, yes, no, or partially? I would like you to think uh, 
on that, if it's possible. I will give you the elements that I, I want you to review. Uh, does your uh, national legal order has all forms of domestic abuse? Penalizes all forms of domestic abuse? It is actually irrelevant whether or not it occurred within the family? Please uh, write at the comment section. I would like you to uh, just think about that. Rahima, is that possible? We can do it right now, you think? Uh, Kara, I think uh, we can discuss at the end of the session. Okay. But I think maybe also meet also Professor Bonini. Also. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. We can do it right now. Okay, okay. Uh, so just uh, keep that in mind, this question, because I would like you to uh, just uh, question yourself about that. And we can continue with the second form of positive obligations, which is the duty to conduct an effective investigation. According to this uh, form of positive obligations, contracting parties shall conduct an effective and thorough investigation capable of leading to the identification and punishment of those responsible. This is not an obligation of result. This is something that you must remember. It doesn't mean that this investigation must lead uh, to a conviction. It's just an obligation of means, but it extends to the proceedings as a whole. So the trial stage is also included. According to the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, the investigation must be independent, impartial, and subject to, to public scrutiny. This uh, subjection to public scrutiny has as a result that the victim or the victim's relative, if we talk about a violation of Article 2, the right to life, I remind you, uh, the victim can participate in this investigation in various forms. Uh, according to the case law, authorities shall take all necessary steps to obtain and secure the evidence concerning the incident. So they have to take a detailed statement from the alleged victim, gather any eyewitness testimony, gather forensic evidence, and of course, uh, gather any additional medical reports, say that this must be conducted or no, and generally uh, act thoroughly. A very important aspect in the second uh, obligation, the duty to conduct an effective investigation, is the element of time. Promptums, promptness uh, and reasonable expedition are necessary prerequisites. And this is something very important in the context of um, the COVID-19 pandemic that affected how the system worked, how timely the system worked. So unnecessary delays are not tolerable. Unnecessary delays can result in a violation of positive obligations. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights, when reviewing whether or not there have been, there has been uh, unnecessary uh, delays uh, reviews the opening of investigation, the uh, possible delays in taking statements, and the length of time taken for the initial investigation. In the case uh, SZ versus Bulgaria of 2015, we read that irrespective of the outcome of the proceedings, this is what I said to you, this is not an obligation of results, uh, a, a, a thorough examination and effective investigation can lead to an acquittal for the accused. So irrespective of the outcome of the proceedings, the protection machinery provided for in domestic law must operate in practice within a reasonable time. So promptly and with, not, uh, with no unnecessary delays for the second form of positive obligations. Uh, here, we're going to see uh, two really important cases in this respect. The Volodina versus Russia, we saw it again before about domestic abuse, and the very recent Tersana versus Albania. In the case of Volodina versus Russia, we read that 
special diligence is required in dealing with domestic violence cases and the specific nature of the domestic violence must be taken into account in the course of the domestic proceedings. Keep this last sentence that the special nature of domestic violence must be taken into account because we're gonna discuss it a little bit uh, further. Then in Tersana versus Albania, we read that violence against women was a widespread problem in Albania according to the international reports and uh, it, it was further noted that violence against women was underreported, under investigated and under prosecuted and under sentenced at the time in Albania. So we see here that the court reviews the, the, the relevant reports, reviews the situation in a country in order to, re, to see, to examine if uh, the duty to conduct an effective investigation actually was followed. Uh, the situation in Albania, according to the court, uh, in this very recent decision, suggested that the police and prosecuting authorities manifested an ineffectual approach to violence against women on the ground of social attitude and cultural values, and that the climate of leniency or impunity prevailed towards perpetrators of violence against women. This is something that, of course, affected, affected their obligation to conduct an effective investigation because they, their, this, act, this climate actually made it impossible for them to review the, the specific nature of domestic violence. Also, in this case, we read that where an attack happens in a general climate as described above, the investigation assumes even greater importance and the investigative authorities should be more diligent in conducting a thorough investigation. So we see that what actually a thorough investigation is, is actually judged in a case-by-case -case basis, reviewing the general climate and the general um, uh, standpoint of the authorities. And what I want you to keep from all this is that whenever there is a suspicion that an attack might be gender motivated, it is particularly important that the investigation is pursued with vigor. So we see that there is an additional onus to uh, authorities to actually review whether or not there was a gender-based element at the case. This is something we um, uh, see in, in, in the respect of Article 14 about uh, discrimination, and we now see it uh, transcending Article uh, 14 and going to Article 3 as an element. Uh, so, the last but not least, uh, the third form of positive uh, obligation uh, is the duty to prevent the known risk of ill treatment. This is a part of the general duty to prevent and suppress offenses against the, an individual. So, uh, according to this, uh, the member states should take positive measures in protective, preventive measures. Of course, uh, it is intolerable that uh, member states take uh, operational measures at every case. So it must be established that the authorities knew or ought to have known at the time of the existence of a real and immediate risk and that they failed to take measures within the scope of their powers, which of course, judged reasonably, might have been expected to avoid that risk. This is something that we read in the landmark case, Osman versus UK of 1998. So we see that only a known risk can give rise to this obligation. We need, of course, a real and immediate risk and measures that can be taken. In this respect, uh, let's review a little bit the case law of the court. First of all, is the case Eremia versus the Republic of Moldova of 2013. Here we read that the court must determine whether the domestic authorities were aware 
or ought to have been aware, this is what we said, that, that only the known risk can give rise to this obligation, of the violence to which the first applicant has been subjected, and of the risk of further violence, and if so, whether all reasonable measures had been taken to protect her and to punish the perpetrator. In Mundeanu versus the Republic of Moldova, again a very recent decision, we also read that the court reiterates that the state authorities have a responsibility to take protective measures in the form of effective deterrence against serious breaches of an individual's personal integrity by a member of her family or by a partner. So we see here that the court believes uh, that domestic abuse uh, can give rise more often uh, to this obligation. We also see that it states that the risk of a real and immediate threat must be assessed, taking due account of the particular context of domestic violence. In such a situation, it is not only a question of an obligation to afford general protection to society, but above all, to take account of the recurrence of successive episodes of violence within a family. So, yes, the court said says that uh, only the known risk of ill treatment uh, can give rise to this positive obligation. Yes, of course, it must be assessed at the case-by-case -case basis, but in the context of domestic violence, there is, by definition, a real and immediate risk because of the possible recurrence of successive episodes, because of its particular character. And this is very important, as we will see, in the framework of domestic abuse uh, in COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, going on with this uh, case law, going forward, uh, we see in the Balsan versus Romania that um, the authority's passivity in the present case was also apparent from the failure to consider any protective measures for the applicant despite the repeated request to the police and the prosecutor and the courts. So here we see that uh, this um, failure to actually uh, give uh, protective uh, measures to the victim uh, was uh, backed up by the known risk, known because the victim itself asked for it. So as we see, uh, this duty is closely connected to to, article, to the first obligation, having uh, available measures for the victims, protective measures for the victims, and here apply them in practice. Let's see just two decisions where violation was actually um, recognized by the court. It is the B versus the Republic of Moldova of 2013. Here, uh, a violation was found because an eviction of the perpetrator of a temporary nature was not provided by authorities. Again, there was an arguable claim by the victim to evict the perpetrator of domestic abuse from the house. This wasn't uh, actually accepted by national um, courts. And then the European Court of Human Rights found that the violation has occurred. And uh, of course, in the landmark decision, in my opinion, Opus versus Turkey of 2009, uh, not issuing an injunction banning the perpetrator from contacting, communicating with, or approaching the victim or entering defined areas resulted in a violation of Article 2. In Opus versus Turkey, those measures were avail available, and uh, if I remember correctly, they could be um, actually uh, uh, ordered by the family court. Uh, the victim asked for them, but uh, there was no issuing of an injunction of such kind that resulted in the death of the applicant's uh, mother in the framework of a widespread um, domestic abuse in this uh, family. So, three forms of positive obligations, uh, gender-based offenses. I think that we made clear how the European Court of Human Rights actually dealt with those cases. And we can now proceed to review 
how COVID-19 uh, pandemic affected gender-based violence and uh, how member states, and especially Greece, responded to their uh, obligations, their three forms of uh, obligations. Uh, Rahima, do you like me to continue with the COVID part or just uh, take a break? I think, I think we are supposed to take a break right now okay. for 15 minutes. And dear citizens, we will be here after 15 minutes. So we will go further with COVID, uh, COVID impacts after the break. So uh, welcome again. Uh, now we're going to talk about the um, uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, and gender-based violence. Uh, I'm going to use some concrete examples uh, from Grace. The examples I'm going to use are largely based uh, on my experience as a member of a legal team of uh, Diotima. Uh, Diotima is an NGO, non-profit organization, non-governmental organization, uh, of, uh, apartheid of women. Uh, and we are uh, giving support, uh, legal counseling, legal representation and empowerment to women victims of uh, domestic violence. Uh, so I'm going to use uh, real uh, examples uh, from our experience during this uh, lockdown uh, period. Uh, so uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic affected the lives of everyone uh, pretty much in the world. And uh, I think they had a very um, large impact on gender-based uh, violence. Uh, first of all, the quarantine and now local lockdowns are uh, um, a reality. So women are forced to stay home with uh, their abusers and sometimes uh, staying home doesn't mean stay safe. So for them, uh, the virus may be less dangerous than staying home. Uh, there is also a description of social and protective networks uh, because as you know, it's uh, really hard to have visits from relatives, from friends that could ease the burden on the victim of domestic abuse. So this is also an issue. And uh, also the insecurity and financial repercussion of the situation uh, affect uh, gender-based violence and domestic violence in particular in a, in, in a twofold way. In the first place, the insecurity and the financial repercussions are giving rise to incidents because uh, the perpetrators are feeling fear, they're feeling frustrated, and they are there is an escalation in their behavior. And at the second, um, at the second fold, uh, uh, I think uh, the insecurity and the financial repercussions are um, a key factor that uh, affects women that want to leave the house. So the insecurity is making women not to tolerate to go forward because they are afraid that they would not have a job or a stable income in the future. So the quarantine, disruption of social and protective networks and financial uh, insecurity led to an escalation of violence uh, during this pandemic. Uh, there are no uh, in Greece uh, concrete data, but we know that the calls to the a woman SOS uh, hotline with state appointed psychologists and social workers um, were really uh, high during this uh, period. Um, I strongly believe that we will see uh, how, we'd, how, how widespread the um, abuse was after uh, the COVID-19 um, issue, uh, because right now women are facing all those problems that I said. Uh, they're in the house, uh, they are away from the relatives and friends that they are, can empower them, and they are afraid to come forward. So um, I strongly believe that we will see the results in the forthcoming uh, months. Uh, and of course, something that uh, is really trouble, um, trouble me is the rise and the escalation of uh, femicides. Uh, in Greece, uh, we don't uh, have uh, specific statistical data because we don't measure femicides as such. It's, they're just uh, homicides. 
but uh, from the media, I'm aware of uh, 10 to 12 femicides from March to August, which is a really big number if we consider that this is only the tip of the iceberg. And I would like to know, and I, I read an article about Turkey too, that there are incidents of uh, femicides. Uh, and in Italy, uh, Professor Brunini would uh, also, would, I would also want your opinion. I also read that there is an escalation. So uh, this is also a very uh, large issue regarding COVID-19 pandemic. And this is also the result of what we said, uh, this character of domestic abuse to worsen and worsen over time. And the COVID-19 pandemic was uh, a, a major trigger for perpetrators to escalate and to be more aggressive and uh, more violent towards their uh, women and their families. So uh, let's uh, review the major issues regarding the pandemic that affect GBV victims. First of all, uh, is the communication with competent authorities. Uh, filing a complaint was also and is also an issue. Uh, going to the police station and meeting with a lawyer uh, due to movement restriction was an ordeal for a lot of victims. Uh, the application of protective measures was also a daunting task. And of course, all those were backed up by the availability of shelters. Uh, let's just uh, fragmentize everything and review each and every one of those issues. Uh, first of all, is the communication with uh, competent authorities. Uh, in Greece, you must know that uh, communication with the police is only available via telephone. So uh, if you have a problem, if anyone has a problem, uh, it should, the police should be called by a landline or by a mobile telephone. There is uh, no email, there is no online chatting, just the telephone. Uh, during the pandemic, because uh, as you can imagine, calling the police when you're at the same house with your abuser is not something easy. An email address was made available, but not to the police, to the SOS, uh, SOS Women Helpline with a state psychologist and uh, a sociologist that could uh, of course, alert the police if an urgent matter arises. Uh, but this is a, a really big problem here, and the COVID-19 made it even worse. Uh, a viable solution uh, could be an application with predefined messages, because as you can imagine, having an online chat with the police uh, would take a lot of resources. So an application with predefined messages could uh, cut back on resources and costs, uh, could inform the police about the situation and the whereabouts of the victim. So this is a viable solution. The solution also uh, has uh, uh, the very good thing that th those predefined messages could be provided in several languages, because right now it's only possible to communicate to the police in Greek and uh, of course, maybe some English, but uh, not everyone uh, speaks uh, English. And this is uh, quite an ordeal for refugees and migrants that do not speak either Greek nor uh, English. And uh, when they need something, they should uh, go with an interpreter of their own to the police station or have a friend or uh, a neighbor that uh, speaks Greek to call the police. And we saw, we see at our job that there the domestic abuse actually worsened during the COVID-19 pandemic and we should consider and we should um, take measures for this uh, population, this part of our population too. So viable solution, application, text messages to alert the police. Uh, filing a complaint. Uh, as we saw, it's really important as part of the positive obligations of the state to take uh, the first, uh, to, to, be, to begin with the investigation of a complaint. But how a complaint was, uh, was to be filed during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that there are incidents in Greece of uh, discouragement from the reporting domestic violence incidents. Uh, 
this is not a, a widespread phenomenon, uh, but it's something that is happening. Uh, so uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, this actually worsened because uh, police station enter in a mode of emergency. So they deal only with uh, emergency situations in order to uh, cut back on resources and prevent people from going to the police station uh, in order not to uh, take an infection of the virus, etc. In this context, uh, domestic violence was not um, dealt as an emergency situation. We actually had the case uh, where a woman visited a police station and uh, the um, police officer told her that they couldn't do anything during the pandemic. Uh, luckily, uh, the hierarchy of the uh, of the police uh, actually intervened upon notice from us and uh, took the complaint from uh, the woman. But this is something that happened and something that I believe that uh, maybe have happened in uh, more cases too. Uh, and another thing that is uh, quite uh, phenomenal is that uh, filing a complaint during the pandemic was only available by appointment. That meant that a victim of domestic abuse was uh, able to go, let's say, to the police station, and then uh, the incident couldn't be filed immediately, but the, the, the victim has to file for an appointment, something that actually delayed everything in this uh, context and actually made the victims um, think that maybe it's not worth it to come forward, uh, no one will listen to them. It was actually something that prevented women from uh, actually reporting. Uh, there was uh, also, uh, due to the COVID-19 uh, situation, a reluctance from the police officers to follow the special procedure for caught in the act of offenders. This is the flagrante delicto, this is a special procedure when someone has recently uh, committed a crime, uh, he has to be immediately put into custody. Uh, this was not followed because it was, uh, as you imagine, a little bit difficult to have many uh, perpetrators in custody during the pandemic. So they were reluctant to do so. But this has uh, severe consequences for victims of domestic abuse because, as you can imagine, uh, taking someone in custody uh, after filing a complaint of domestic abuse would um, uh, left the victim with the house uh, and the perpetrator was to be removed immediately. Uh, so something like that uh, couldn't happen in the situation. Uh, last but not least, there was also uh, a restriction on victims' rights. Uh, as you may have heard, uh, in Greece and uh, in other EU member states, we have, uh, besides the positive obligations of, uh, of the European Convention of Human Rights, uh, a directive on victims' rights in criminal proceedings. According to this directive, the victim has several rights in this um, part of the proceedings. Uh, an example, an indicative example of restriction of rights during the pandemic was the inability of the victim to have, uh, in some cases, not uh, every time, uh, its appointed lawyer present during the filing of the complaint. For example, we had a case um, where there was a migrant uh, woman, did not speak any Greek, so we needed an, an interpreter, and of course the lawyer. However, the police officer said that it's impossible to have so many people, the interpreter, the woman, and the lawyer present during the filing of the complaint, and said that the lawyer couldn't be present. Uh, that meant that at this, this very early stage of the proceedings, the victim was deprived of uh, its lawyer's uh, presence, uh, meaning that possibly this could lead uh, to problems in the prosecution and problems at the later stage of the proceedings. So you see that there are many instances where COVID-19 measures um, actually interfere with victims' rights. Uh, movement restrictions. Movement restrictions was uh, also a thing uh, that affected uh, victims of domestic uh, violence and GBV victims. 
uh, going to the police station uh, was uh, not something that was specifically uh, provisioned in the exceptions of uh, movement restrictions. So going to the police station required a form of negotiation with the police officers that controlled the movement of the citizens, something that can be, uh, can't be tolerated because going to the police station is an emergency. And meeting with a lawyer, meeting with a lawyer was also impossible, and that couldn't be something to negotiate with the uh, police uh, authorities that uh, as, uh, regulated um, the uh, movement restrictions uh, because it was no exception. So meeting with a lawyer was only possible through uh, telephone, through Skype, through other applications, something that was uh, a real ordeal for uh, victims of domestic abuse because as you may understand uh, those cases uh, are not uh, simple cases for example a victim of theft uh, we don't have to discuss much with a victim of, of theft we just uh, say okay you, ha you have to say what happened you have to say what you saw from the perpetrator let's go and file a complaint but in case of the victims of domestic abuse, there are several things that arise. For example, it's not only the filing of the complaint, but, but we must build a safety plan, a safe plan for the women to exit the house, a plan for um, uh, having custody of the children, what will happen with the children, what will happen with the house. There are several uh, legal uh, matters that we must address and meeting through telephone on those instances is not the appropriate way to solve it. So legal counseling was a really daunting task for domestic abuse victims during this uh, situation. Uh, so I strongly believe that uh, because we're gonna go, uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, I believe to more local lockdowns, GBV victims uh, must be exempt from national lockdown measures in respect to going to the police station and meeting with their lawyers in order to safeguard their uh, rights. Uh, something that we talked about, uh, which is really important and it's part of the third uh, form of positive obligations for victims is the protective measures, the application for protective measures. Uh, in Greece, in order to have protective measures, uh, it is imperative that the victim asks them. Uh, it's, it's an application for interim measures, actually, uh, where you can get a restraining order or a protection order. Those applications were really affected during this uh, pandemic. Uh, during the quarantine, this is something that's changed now that we're not into uh, a general quarantine. Filing for protection measures uh, was contingent upon a decision from a judge that there was a real risk. This was not uh, examined uh, with, uh, there were no guidelines, let's say uh, those offenses uh, are of immediate risk or in those are not, there was no guidelines. So there was an examination on a case by case basis uh, and the judge was free to decide on a case by case basis. So as we saw, this is not uh, really something that is in line with positive obligations in, in terms of domestic abuse, because in this context, not all judges were taking account that by definition, protection measures in case of domestic violence are of fundamental importance to prevent further aggression or further assault. Again, an example with the offense of theft shows that this is completely different situation and the danger can be completely different. Uh, as a result of all those things that we said and the inability in some cases to file for interim measures and the fear that th this was also a thing that uh, applying for inter interim measures in this context could lead to losing them, not have them uh, ordered, resulted that after filing a complaint, after being able to secure an appointment and file for a complaint, the victim was left displaced from the household and vulnerable to further attacks. This uh, displacement could also be remedied by an interim measure to uh, 
evict the perpetrator, but as I said, this was not something very easy to accomplish, not as easy as it was before the quarantine. Uh, this uh, displacement was backed up by the availability of shelters because, as you know, uh, and this is part of also positive obligations imposed by the Istanbul Convention, shelters uh, must be available for victims of GBV violence. Uh, however, uh, the women's refugees available to Athens and several other um, towns in uh, Greece were already high occupant. During this uh, pandemic, there were also issues relating to the inability to conduct the necessary medical examination for admission, because you have to know that there is no uh, automatic admission to a women's refugee shelter. There must be some medical examination. And during this uh, uh, pandemic, uh, it was also imperative to have testing for COVID-19. And at the beginning of the situation, COVID-19 tests were not available at, at a large scale. So there were also issues with that. Uh, you must also know that uh, if the refugees in Athens were um, really overcrowded. So in many instances, even before the quarantine, uh, we actually sent women, uh, divert women to another town, maybe uh, in the northern uh, uh, Greece, etc., which is really good for them because uh, they are changing their environment. They are um, away, really away from the perpetrator. But this was not um, something that could happen during the quarantine because uh, first of all, most of the transportation didn't work, the public transportation. Uh, there were no available planes uh, in some cases. Re relocation was not an option during the situation, as you may understand. So already high occupant women's refugees, especially in Athens, uh, uh, inability to conduct the necessary medical examination. And of course, our third, uh, our second best chance uh, to have the woman uh, at a, store, a short visit to a hotel was also not an option because the majority of the hotels uh, were closed. As a result of all the above, the inadequate response of the judicial system, along with the fact that the women refugees were not fully operational, left domestic violence victims unprotected at a very high uh, scale. Uh, but in general, I would like to make a general remark, not only for domestic abuse victims that were uh, really hit by this uh, situation. Uh, let's uh, review some general shortcomings affecting GBV victims. Uh, first of all, there were and there are still serious delays at all stages of criminal proceedings, something that we said that this is not tolerable according to the European Court of Human Rights. Those serious delays can result in uh, time-barred offenses and generally in under and uh, protection of the victims. Uh, there are also uh, issues regarding the investigation of sexual assaults due to the reluctance of the victim to promptly seek help. Uh, let's see, for example, uh, there, there are victims of, for example, rape, uh, that happened that occurred in April or uh, in March that we had the quarantine, that they were reluctant to promptly go to the hospital to get tested, to uh, have the medical examination take place due to, uh, on, the, on the one hand of the lockdown measures, and of course, the fear of infection. So you have offenses like rape that they need to be addressed immediately to secure the evidence, uh, and victims that they are coming forward now, for example, in August, and that uh, there is a lot of issues regarding the evidence because there are no DNA, there is no uh, physical examination, there is no uh, categorization of bruises, and no way to actually uh, go forward with a strong case in that respect. So we see that there are general shortcomings that will leave GBV victims unprotected and uh, perpetrators unpunished. Uh, ending my presentation, uh, I would like to sum up some things that we saw today. 
First of all, I would all you to remember that uh, contracting parties to the European Convention of Human Rights have a duty to set up a legislative framework, an effective legislative framework to prevent punish uh, and punish uh, uh, ill treatment by private individuals. There is also a duty to conduct an effective investigation with uh, what being an effective investigation in the uh, being in the analysis that preceded. And of course, and this is very important, uh, when the authorities are aware of an imminent risk, they must act. They must, uh, they have a duty to apply re relevant laws, to order operational measures, to order protective measures. Uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, I strongly believe they will change the way that we address uh, victims. Uh, telemedicine, uh, online chat applications are of fundamental importance during this uh, time. Uh, and we must find new ways to address victims and victims' needs uh, in all forms, uh, in all stages of uh, criminal procedure. And this is, will be uh, a task for all of us and for national legal orders to find a way to address the needs in this new environment. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for being uh, here. Again, I would like to thank uh, the Professor Adam Sojur and Rahim for their kind invitation uh, and this uh, summer school. Uh, I'm um, including my details, so if any one of you, besides the questions that we're gonna ask today, want anything and has any question, please contact me and I hope that in the future we will have the chance uh, to meet uh, in person. Thank all of you. Thank you so much. Many, many thanks, Kara. Thank you for your this very comprehensive and very systematic uh, review of all the situation regarding inclusive obligation in case of domestic violence and gender-based.